afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Chris Baird. He has lived in Ohio County for 41 years. He served in the military for six years, stationed overseas and in California. Chris is currently a production planner at Alcoa Warwick Operations in Newburgh, Indiana. He started volunteering at the Ohio County Food Pantry around 2009. <clears throat> and he has worked with the core group from that point on. Chris was nominated for the position of Ohio County Food Pantry Director in 2017 of August and is happily serving in this position currently. Please give a warm welcome to Chris Barrett. <laughs> Should have started making my way up here a little earlier, huh? <laughs> um, so first and foremost, I'm going to ask a question that's burning in everybody's mind. What did that guy do to his foot? <laughs> so, I was trying to work up this big heroic story about how I did something, and as an act of my heroism, I injured my foot, but I just couldn't come up with anything. So I have to tell you the truth. I back-talked my wife one too many times, and she backed over my foot with a car. <laughs> Okay, so I'm uh, being called out on the carpet. Uh, some in this room know that's not true. It was just a, a routine surgery to uh, take care of a bone, uh, a bone spur. But at any rate, uh, I have fun with it as I can. I want to thank you guys for having me out. Um, what I would like to discuss today is just some, some basic facts about our food pantry, about your food pantry. This is your high County food pantry. And uh, I have to say thank you, first and foremost, because without the great people of Ohio County, the business leaders, business owners, individuals, farmers, uh, just good people who have a great heart, the Ohio County Food Pantry would not exist. It takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of people to make what we do a success. And that rests on your shoulders. And we're very thankful for folks like you. Um, so just some statistics uh, to go to set the pace and to let everybody know what's going on. Um, across the nation at this very moment, one out of every seven people living in America are turning to a food pantry somewhere uh, to help themselves and their families. It's one out of seven. One out of seven. It's roughly 47 million people. So that's a big number. I can't wrap my brain around 47 million people. So I did a little digging, a little looking, and if you look across our nation, 47 million equals about the population of Florida and Texas. That's still pretty big, and I still can't wrap my brain around that. So we bring it a little closer to home in, in the bluegrass state. We boast about four and a half million residents. Uh, it's just rough numbers. So one in seven of that, 640,000 people, face food insecurity. So again, that's 640,000 people who don't know where their next meal's coming from, let alone what it might be. So statistics go on to tell us that of that 640,000 people, roughly 28% are children. It's about 180,000 people. Those are some pretty rough numbers. That's pretty tough. A lot of people don't see that every day. If you don't see it, you don't realize it. Don't realize it, you don't know it exists. Don't know it exists, you can't help the problem. So information and awareness is just as much what the food pantry is about as <coughs> food pantries. So Closer to home here in the great communities of Ohio County, and I truly believe we live in a, a great county, because Ohio Countyans have stepped up for years and years on end to fill the gap and to support the need. But in Ohio County, roughly 26,000 people, 14.5% of those 26,000 people, that's about 3,500 or so, don't know where the next meal's coming from. So we're getting some better numbers now, something we can wrap our hands around. Of that, about a thousand are children. So these are kids in our schools. 
all of our, our schools across the county, I don't know how many schools we have, 14, 15, 16, something like that. Lots of kids out there who have food insecurities. That's wrong. And we do a lot about that. But there's a lot left to be done. So these are kids that, that we are going to rely on here in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years to come sit in this room and have these conversations. So we, we take it seriously. This isn't just a matter of putting a little bit of food out so somebody has something to eat. We want to take it to the next step. What's that old saying? You can teach a man to fish, or give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish. And you've done him a world of good. He'll feed himself forever. So there's a lot to be done. A lot that we are doing. So that one in seven number, something else that you don't realize, and I didn't realize it, I don't guess you, uh, you think a lot about it because if you don't see it, you don't know it. But one in seven, that means that somebody in your family or in your circle of friends, your kids' circle of friends, they're going to interact today or maybe Monday <coughs> next week when we're back off fall break or, or whatever. They're going to interact with somebody who has a food insecurity. It's that close to home. Like I said, you don't know it, you don't see it. So, again, awareness. So, your Ohio County Food Pantry has been stepping in to fill that gap for roughly 10 years or so. Um, in cooperation with Feeding America, Kentucky Heartland, a great outfit, um, federal government commodity programs. <coughs> Um, we have been able to help people have a fighting chance. A lot of good people out there just need a little bit of help. And they just need a fighting chance. Um, so in order to qualify to receive food to the food pantry, the individual or family must provide some type of identification, uh, proof of residence within the county, and they must qualify for the program per the income guidelines. Um, at one time, we did not require this. And we saw, we saw the need for change because people are going to be people, <coughs> good, bad, and ugly. Uh, so, like I say, most of the folks are just Ohio Countyans who need a little nudge. Others are seniors who are uh, solely relying on their Social Security check, whose, whose check is just getting smaller and smaller every month, seems like. Uh, so, they have a senior commodity that we help them out with that we are honored to help them out with that is uh, subsidized by the government. So the goal of the food pantry, and I'm just gonna throw out some information here. If you have questions, interrupt me. If I say something that doesn't make sense, laugh at me. I'm okay with that. Um, wife and family laugh at me all the time, so it's all good. Um, so the goal of the food pantry is to put enough food in a person's vehicle in their hands that day or, or night to feed them for about a week. We go, our goal is seven days. We strive for seven to ten days. It's, um, it's easy to give away more food than you should. And I've told people to come to the pantry to help, to the people who build boxes, the people who are packing food out to people's cars. I tell those people, I challenge you to come here in a bad mood and leave in a bad mood. Because you can't do it. You come and you're helping somebody. So in that helping generos generosity, um, in that frame of mind with that attitude, you're wanting to help and you're wanting to give more food away. Well, that's great. And we've done that a lot, but it hits a pocketbook. So we have to draw a line somewhere and say, Here, here's what we're going to give. Here's about what we're going to be able to provide. Here's about what the Ohio Countyans are, are giving their money to. So we're going to feed. We're going to meet the demand. And we always do. Ohio Countyans have always stepped up to the plate, every time. Um, so another great benefit that we get from uh, working with uh, the government through Feeding America, and that's the uh, Feeding America Kentucky Heartland. Uh, you can go to map the meal gap and get all the information that I'm giving you, the statistics. Uh, another benefit is the backpack program. Anybody familiar with the backpack program? know a little bit about it. Okay, so that is an excellent program 
But our kids in school who, again, if they qualify, they receive a backpack Friday when they leave to go home from school with 17 to 19 food items, shelf-stable food items, that they'll have to last them over the weekend. It's not per se enough to feed them six, nine, 12 meals over the weekend, but it's enough to bridge that gap. That's a wonderful program. It truly is a wonderful program. Um, so that child receives food and he'll have something just to, to get him across the weekend um, until he comes back to school that Monday or Tuesday, hopefully on a Monday, because we know there's a lot of kids out there who have parents who unfortunately don't prioritize feeding. So it's a much needed program. Um, so if I wasn't part of the pantry, and if I didn't know what they did there, I'd probably be like you guys right now, I just have a ton of questions. Um, so I'll just take you through a day at the pantry, starting with when the truck comes. And here's, I'm gonna start out right now, I'm gonna say that there's no way in the world I could thank everybody who has helped us uh, to do what we do. It's by no means a one-man show. The entire county chips in to get this done. Um, we order our food, which is roughly I don't know, six to 8,000 pounds on any given order. And the Ohio County Road Department sends a truck, two guys, a truck and a trailer, to Elizabethtown to pick our food up for us and bring it back. So that's money that we would have been spending on trucking charges because we just don't have the resources. And we'd rather spend that money on food. So the Ohio County Road Department takes care of that for us, and we're very thankful. So when that truck shows up and comes back from Elizabethtown, there's a group of volunteers. Um, all volunteers are voluntold, depending on who you are and who your spouse is. Um, the volunteers take care of unloading the truck. They'll either take a day off of work or shift their work hours just so they can be there to drive a forklift or to, to sling boxes off of a skid. Um, but they show up. Um, the Ohio County Agriculture Departments, and I may be misspeaking, but I know um, so we do see a lot of that, but that is, again, that's our relationship with Feeding America, and that's something that Ohio County has granted us, is to be able to have that relationship with them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, because again, I say, if you don't know, if you don't know what you don't know, if you don't know there's a problem, you don't know how you can help. You don't know that you need to help. There's a lot of different ways to help. I've seen a lot of companies who will hold food drives. Uh, we just picked up a food drive this morning at Wayland Elementary. Uh, the kids in the beta club have been collecting food for I don't know how long, but it seemed like the boxes were never gonna stop. It just kept coming out the door, <laughs> just kept coming. And it's just amazing. And it's given those kids the opportunity to do something good and they're taking that home with them. They're taking the knowledge home with them that they did something for somebody. And it's just, it's an amazing thing. We're so thankful for them. Uh, we see companies who will do a company match. Uh, they'll match a percentage of what an employee gives to the food pantry. Um, some people give cash. And we've had a, I've had a conversation just in this room earlier. People give what they want to give, how they want to give it, and we are just perfectly fine with that. Please understand that with money, we can buy so much more food than anybody else can. I just tell you that as a matter of fact. But your company, your business is awarded. Um, <coughs> it was verified that by our faith, we've done the right thing. We're moving forward. We have what we need when we need it. Um, like I said, the donations from people, we do food drives, we're doing uh, meals for construction program tomorrow, uh, Boston Butts that we've been selling. Uh, it's those things fund that operation. So we do have some more things going on at the pantry here very soon. We've got a local group that is going to fund our freezer. Uh, we're just so thankful for that. They stepped up and, and approached us. And again, you know, we don't, we're not approaching people looking for money or handouts we're doing this as a matter of making Ohio County better 
So we've been asked a lot too about why so big. So two reasons behind that. One reason is there's no way we could build a brand new building that big under new construction guidelines. So we're doing a remodel, had to be big enough to cover the old building, and we're actually saving some of the old building. Um, and the whole building is not going to be just a food pantry. So for years to come, what we would like to see is a place for people to learn. Because you'd be surprised, and we would not have known this had we not been given food out for the last seven, eight, nine, ten years. You'd be surprised how many people don't know what to do with the food you give them. So what we would like to see, and we've had several people uh, come forward and express interest in giving cooking classes. Teach people how to cook with the food we give them. You'd be surprised at how many people say, well, we don't use that when we want to do it. We just throw it away. That's not acceptable. Don't throw it away, bring it back. But I want to teach them how to use it. I want to teach people how to handle their finances. And there are people out there to do that. So we can have classes. So it's going to be more than just a place to go get food. It's going to be a place to go get some education. Because we can make Ohio County better in more ways than just feeding somebody. Make Ohio County, Ohio County brighter. Give them a little knowledge. So that's the, the main goal. That's what we're going for. Sure, we're there to help bridge that gap of hunger. But we want to make Ohio County brighter. You guys have any questions? Anything at all? We're new on social media, by the way. Uh, my daughter is just... Not that I'm biased, but she's doing a real bang-up job. Go out and look at Ohio <laughs> County Food Pantry, and uh, you'll just see all kinds of neat stuff. So she's a, a, a wizard at that kind of thing, and I think I'm back in the Stone Age. Um, I think that's about all I have. If you guys have anything for me, feel free. I mean, I'm accessible. You can call that pantry phone. Either my wife or I will answer it. If you see us out there, stop by. You know, we won't put you to work the first time, but <laughs> no guarantee on the second time. But uh, that's all I got. Thank you. I've been pointed to, which I guess means I'm supposed to get up and talk next. Uh, I'm kind of jealous standing here because when I was president of the chamber, we never had a crowd this big. So y'all are doing something right. That's great. Uh, great to see everybody. Uh, I'm here to introduce my boss, uh, Auditor Mike Harmon. Uh, Auditor Harmon was elected as the Auditor of Public Accounts, which is a statewide elected office, in 2015, and he began his term in 2016, so he's finishing it up uh, the second year of his first term. Uh, prior to being State Auditor, uh, Auditor Harmon was a state representative from Boyle, KC and at one point Washington County. I at Boyle and Washington and Fish, Boyle and KC. Uh, Boyle County is uh, the city that's known in Boyle County as Danville, but you're not from Danville, you're from Junction, Junction City. Lived in both, but yes. Okay. Uh, so, Auditor Harm is going to come speak about the work of our office. Now, when I tell people I work for the Auditor's office, what do they do? They clam up. <laughs> because they think I'm looking at their taxes or something, but that's not the kind of auditing we're talking about. Uh, our office looks at how taxpayer dollars are spent on a local and state level. And it's a big job, and as a client taught me many years ago, the reward for good work is more work. And our office does good work, I believe, because we are in high demand. So it's my pleasure to have Audra Harmon come and speak to you. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Well, I know there's no mic today, except me, of course, but uh, we will certainly sit. All right, if I shut this, just so I can get a little space here. Well, I certainly appreciate being here today, and uh, we appreciate Chris. Chris is doing a, a great job. Uh, he takes his job very seriously and uh, very thorough. Now, those who know me know that when uh, whenever I go speak, I always like to start with something funny, or as Congressman Guthrie always tells me, at least I think it's funny anyway. So 
Uh, but there was this gentleman that basically traveled the world, traveled the world, and then all of a sudden he stumbles into this cannibal bar. And he thought, cannibal bar? This is ridiculous. Why would there be a cannibal bar here? So he goes in, and it's kind of like you've seen the coffee shops, you know, where they have basically written up there. They had like a, a missionary, $10. They had teacher, $20. They had construction worker, 50 But right down at the bottom, they had politician, $125. They thought, $125? My goodness, why is a politician $125? So he calls the guy over and he says, what's the deal here? I mean... $10, and then down at the bottom, $125 for a politician. Guy leans over and says, you ever try to clean one of them things? <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know in the auditor's office if we clean any politicians, and uh, thankfully we have no politicians here today. We have statesmen and stateswomen, so, uh, so thankfully none of that. But once again, thank you for having me here. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was first elected state auditor, I knew that I needed to have a outstanding people around me in the what we call team follow the data because uh, when I first arrived there I told all our auditors I don't want to hear that you're targeting anybody I don't want to hear that you're giving anybody a pass I just want you to follow the data and that's what we do we follow the data we <coughs> confirm the data and we report the data <coughs> now since I took office uh, the one thing that I certainly have learned is that uh, we have plenty to do just as Chris had indicated uh, it seems like uh, uh, we do such a great work that we have more and more people asking us to do more and more now whether it's formal requests from uh, state county or local government or uh, complaints or concerns that we have on our hotline which is 1-800-KY-ALERT or you can go to auditor.ky.gov if you have any concerns uh, we have very very much to do and with that great work also come some important legislative changes in the last two sessions that are crucial to our purpose as an agency that shines the light on concerns in government and brings transparency to the taxpayers of Kentucky. Now during my first legislative session as auditor, we were able to get Senate Bill 168 passed in both chambers and signed into law. Now that bill <coughs> came about after questions were raised during the prior auditor's term about whether our office had the legal ability to audit cities, and in this particular case, the city of Somerset. Now, when I became aud auditor, my <coughs> office worked closely with Kentucky League of Cities as well as the bill sponsor, Senator Steve West, uh, on legislation that would clearly define the state auditor's authority in conducting audits and special exams and Oddly enough, we even worked with the uh, mayor of Somerset who had the initial concern. Uh, Senate Bill 168 essentially codifies and clarifies the role and responsibility of the auditor's office when it comes to conducting special exams or audits in cities in the Commonwealth. Now, one of the first special exams for a city that we completed after the passage of this legislation was the special examination of the city of Irvin in Estill County which was requested actually by the town's mayor. We had also had some anonymous tips in that regards. Now, many of those seven findings in our exam, which was referred to the Attorney General's office, the IRS, the Kentucky Department of Revenue, uh, dealt with internal controls and oversight. For example, we found that the city's clerk was performing financial duties with very little, if any, oversight. In one case, she had approved a raise for a city employee without the mayor's signature and had opened and closed bank accounts without review or approval from the mayor. Now, another example was the payment of bonuses to city workers, which is in violation of Section 3 of the Kentucky Constitution. And this one, in some ways, is a little bit funny. We find some funny things in odds. It's unfortunate, but funny. But when a prior audit, audit they had had basically through a CPA, uh, they had come in and indicated to them that this was illegal, that you couldn't pay bonuses. Uh, the city changed its methodology and began purchasing and distributing gift cards. Now, the reason I say that it's funny is because they were told not to do it, but during the course of our examination work, we discovered a check written for $1,650 in fiscal year 2014, which was after that had their other audit, which in the four line of the check indicated that it was four Christmas bonuses. So 
uh, I thought that was funny. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna do something against the Constitution, try not to document it. You know, at least not in, in that thorough detail. I'm not trying to give tips to people to bypass there. But uh, the city of Irvin also had errors on tax withholdings for federal and state taxes for employees and contractors, and failed to submit their tax payments on a timely basis and in the correct amount and the IRS and the Kentucky Department of Revenue. Now because of that failure, the city was charged nearly $18,000 in penalties. Of course, this is a small city. That's a lot for any city, but for a small city, definitely a lot. By the IRS and the Kentucky Department of Revenue between the years 2010 and September 2015. Now those, of course, are just a few examples of some of the things we've found. And as I tell everybody, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, you can go to auditor.ky.gov and pull up any of these audits, including this one, and take a look at that as well. No, I'm just kidding. Chris is like, no, you shouldn't say that. You know, These are exciting stuff. Now, another significant piece of legislation that our office passed uh, during really just this last session uh, in 2017 was House Bill 189. Now this bill will bring greater transparency and accountability to the 15 area development districts we have across Kentucky. Now many of you may remember the special examination done by my uh, predecessor of the Bluegrass Area Development District in Lexington. That examination, which was released in March of 2014, found that there were serious issues with management operating outside its scope and lack of proper oversight and concerns of the financial activity of the ad. Now most recently there were questions with the Barron River Area Development District and the uh, decision by its former executive director to use more than $82,000 in federal and state funding that was actually designated for aging and independent living, which is kind of relevant since we're standing in the senior citizen place, uh, as bonuses for Brad employees over a five-year period. Now Brad addressed those issues internally, including paying back those funds and seeking new leadership after the former executive director resigned. But again, it raised questions about increased oversight of ad districts and the need for greater transparency. Now several groups, including my office led by our Chief of Staff, Sarah Beth Gregory, and the leadership of the Kentucky Council of Area Development Districts and the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce worked together on the bill which sailed through the House and the Senate and was signed into law by Governor Bevin. Now the Kentucky Chamber played a major role in supporting this legislation because of the large amount of workforce development funds that flow through the development districts and the importance of having a well-trained workforce for attracting new jobs and expanding businesses. And now House Bill 189 will require area development districts to comply with transparency and accountability laws already in place for similar agencies like the Kentucky Association of Counties. The new law, among a number of new requirements, prohibits the awarding of bonuses and one-time salary adjustments for ad employees and requires ads to submit financial reports to the LRC and ad boards that detail how funds are allocated and spent in the number of people that are served by the ad programs. Now, as for my office, House Bill 189 gives us the right of first refusal to conduct each of the ad's annual financial statement audits, which is the same process we use for fiscal court audits. We also will have the ability to conduct reviews of audits as of ads by outside accounting firms to ensure that all 15 districts are being audited consistently and appropriately. Now, Kentucky's area development districts have and continue to serve a valuable role in the Commonwealth. House Bill 189 will guarantee that the districts are doing so in a completely transparent manner. Now, those are but two examples of changes through legislation we have pushed for and have been successful with since I took office as we continue towards our goal of exposing how lack of internal controls can lead to questions and concerns from the public. Now, I mentioned earlier about how we referred several findings from our exam of the city of Irvin to law enforcement. Our office often uh, makes referrals of findings from both special examinations and county audits to various state and federal agencies. Those range from the FBI to the IRS to the Kentucky State Police, Attorney General's Office, and the Executive Branch Ethics Commission, just among others. Now, we have also referred findings from county audits to local county attorneys and also to local ethics boards. 
Now, one of those re, uh, referrals resulted in a guilty plea and resignation of a former county clerk and a deputy clerk who was the clerk's sister in eastern Kentucky. And a second referral led to the indictment of a former county fire department chief for allegedly using department funds to pay for repairs on his personal vehicle based on our examination findings. Now, that individual initially pleaded not guilty at first, but has since changed his plea to guilty to one count of abuse of public trust less than $10,000. Now, in each of those special examinations conducted by my office over the past months, we have found how lack of oversight and proper controls led to questionable practices, which is, of course, a recurring issue that we see over time. Probably one of the exams that garnered the largest attention from the press and from the public was our governance audit of the University of Louisville Foundation and its relationship to U of L. First of all, we had issues gathering documents and interviewing staff for that exam and the prior leadership of the foundation and the university. And oftentimes the information, of course, that we did receive was unclear and or inconsistent. One example of this issue we encountered involves foundation vendor reports that contain discrepancies such as missing vendors and lack of detailed information. Now, this information should not have been difficult to produce and should have been accessible to the foundation management to ensure proper oversight. In another set of vendor information that was provided to our office, a note was left attached, and this is another one of those funny things that you just kind of got to laugh at. There was a note. They, I'm pretty sure they didn't mean us to, for us to have it, but there was a note attached to it on a, on a little sticky. If any more info to add on former foundation director, we have and need to add at discretion, end quote. I don't think they meant for us to have that particular one. Now, an additional issue we discovered was the failure to include the university's chief financial officer in the meeting of financial, uh, the foundation's finance committee, which directly contradicted both the foundation bylaws and the CFO's contract. Uh, we found multiple issues, but perhaps the, uh, the one that was probably hardest for me to understand was here was a foundation that at times was considered to be a billion dollar foundation and they did not have budget to actuals. Now, uh, my, I'm uh, basically church moderator at our church and uh, we do budget to actuals, you would think a foundation that large, as well as they did not provide orientation uh, to their new board members. Also something that is a little bit odd. <clears throat> Most recently, we completed our financial statement audit of the Louisville Arena Authority, which oversees KFC Yum Center in Louisville. While the audit only had one finding related to the late payments to the arena of the University of Louisville Athletics Association, we had several observations that we believe need to be brought to the arena's attention. They include the fact that a dedicated fund for maintenance and repairs of the arena, which typically is supposed to receive $3 million a year annually from the arena receipts, only had little more than $642,000 in the account after six years. We also found that because of the use of third-party vendors, the arena authority has no full-time employees monitoring the Yum Center's operation for finances. That makes it challenging for the board members to exercise oversight because they must rely on information from vendors who have an interest in maintaining their contracts. And perhaps one of the most, to me not necessarily disturbing, but somewhat disturbing, is that we found that 75% of the Louisville Arena Authority cash flow comes from taxpayers, including the TIF, uh, as well as money from the city of Louisville. Uh, you would think something of that broad and that big and that popular would be able to provide for itself. Now, just recently, the Louisville Arena Authority was able to have uh, their bonds upgraded, so we were glad that from junk bond status, which will, of course, go for a long way in refinancing, providing the much-needed savings they have to uh, keep it going. Now, the first major special examination my office released was our examination of the Department of Criminal Justice training and its usage of CLEP funds, or the Kentucky Controls Over Funds, often led to expenditures without DOCJT, uh, training uh, for the purpose of CLEP. Uh, one, uh, one thing that I will uh, just mention on that particular one uh, that was uh, somewhat, uh, I guess, a little bit funny. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was not funny, but one of the things that was funny is they were using travel vouchers to purchase office chairs, uh, travel vouchers. They also used travel vouchers to purchase bourbon balls, and I just thought, well, if those chairs had wheels, perhaps they could be used as travel, but if you're eating the bourbon balls at the same time, you could possibly be pulled over for DUI. Just, just a thought. But anyway, 
Another uh, special exam that we released was the Kentucky Horse Park. Uh, we found issues caused by lack of internal controls and oversight. Uh, one of the uh, items that uh, kind of stood out to me on that particular one um, was that of the food service contracts that we looked at, 80% uh, 80 80 of them were billed, not billed according to contracts. Some of them were higher, some of them were lower, um, but, uh, but they were not billed according to contract. And when, we, when our auditors actually ask, you know, what's the difference? And they said, well, during the process, some of them didn't use it all, or some used more, so we adjusted according to the documentation. And they said, that's great, where's the documentation? And they said, oh, we destroyed that uh, after we completed the events. Like so, not exactly uh, the uh, best way to do it. And uh, finally, in regards to audits, uh, we just recently completed an audit of the Jackson County Fiscal Court uh, where there was a combined 75 findings between the fiscal year 2015 and 2016, uh, really the most that I'd ever seen. And uh, one of the things that was very egregious, the uh, former treasurer, definitely former treasurer now, had written herself a uh, $114,000 in additional checks uh, that she was not due improper writing in that regards. Uh, and uh, 60,000 of those came from federal funds, the CFET, CSEP funds, and about 54,000 of those just came from their own general fund. Now, as you may or may not know, our office does more than 600 audits per year, ranging from county government to our annual statewide single audit of Kentucky that looks at how the Commonwealth is utilizing both state and federal tax dollars. And as I mentioned earlier, many of our reoccurring issues we have seen during our special examinations are dealing with a lack of oversight and proper controls, which of course led to questionable practices by those that we examined. As for our county audits, like in the past years, the biggest issue that we continue to see is uh, a lack of segregation of duties. And uh, I will tell just one little joke, uh, additional joke, as we get close to closing. But uh, did you hear about the uh, auditor that had a really big concern about his pet? Yeah, his uh, dog was using the bathroom in the exact same place, and he had concerns about segregation of duties. But okay, <laughs> that, that, that was bad. That was bad. But anyway, now of course I made just a little light of that. But I, I know that this this particular finding frustrates many of our local officials. Uh, however, lack of segregation of duties, just as we had talked, does increase the risk for fraud and funds being misappropriated. So we certainly we can make a little light of it, but at the same time we need to take it seriously. And uh, while the majority of smaller rural counties may not have the availability of funds to have additional staff, we certainly encourage them to continue to recommend utilizing compensating factors to help address that. Now, we certainly welcome any feedback and thoughts that you might have. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, if you have any tips or concerns, uh, you can call 1-800-KY-ALERT or you can go to auditor.ky.gov. Once again, certainly appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. And if you all have any questions, I'd certainly be open to questions. I really appreciate the opportunity, and if you need anything, let me know. And uh, once again, we appreciate the hard work of, of Chris. He does a great job. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you to both of our speakers for coming today. We greatly appreciate the information that was shared. Um, just announcements real quick that we'll go through. There's several Chris Christmas parades coming up on December 2nd. Um, Fordsville is at 1 p.m. Cromwell is at 1 p.m. Beaverdam is at 4. Hartford's at 6. And Centertown has not been decided yet on a time. Uh, we have Small Business Saturday coming up, uh, which is this coming Saturday. Uh, you may have seen some information out on Facebook. Some of our local businesses are pushing that. The Chamber is pushing an ad in the paper. Uh, coming out this week so look for those it just informs the public about uh, businesses that are doing specials on Saturday you'll also see that on the OC monitor so if you want to see those specials that are going on for small business Saturday we do encourage you all to check that out in the paper and on the OC monitor uh, our Christmas game is coming up on December 12th it'll be here in this room uh, we have several <coughs> items that we're going to have for our silent auction this year uh, we wanted to make those items known so we could hopefully have a good turnout and some competitive bidding going on. 
we have a total of four UK basketball tickets. We have an overnight stay and a dinner for two at Patty's. We have a Opryland hotel gift card. We have a Street Glow car wash detail uh, donated to us. We have Smith House gift certificates available. Uh, tickets for Owensboro Symphony Orchestra and performance. Uh, we have several gift baskets. We have spray tan gift certificates from Dynamic Tanning and Boutique. We have two free extra value meals per week for one year from McDonald's. Uh, we have OCHS All Season Sports Pass, two of those, and a six month membership to the Family Wellness Center. So just to give you all an idea of what's coming, there's more coming in, uh, but please be looking uh, to come in and help bid for those items at the Christmas Gala. Uh, invitations will be mailed out next week for the gala. Please RSVP so we know we have a proper count for the meal that will be prepared for us. Uh, we have something for all of our chamber members to take with them today. On the back table where the donated can items are, are our new logos for the doors uh, with our chamber information on that. If you're a chamber member, we want that information displayed. Uh, on our local businesses. The, the information that's previously there is the outdated logo. Uh, this includes the new logo and uh, please take one when you leave today. Do we have any announcements from any of our members that are here today? There's another parade I think. Did I leave one out? <clears throat> yeah, North Branch I have one. Okay. This Saturday. This Saturday? At 10. 10 a.m. North Branch 10 a.m. Okay, um, for our business in the spotlight, that will be Wes Roberts from Assured Partners NL. Get Judy the information and we'll um, display that in our newsletter and on the presentation. You have your red tickets with you. We have a prize today uh, donated by Commonwealth Community Bank. And it is... No, man, thank you. <laughs> Judy? Uh, ticket number 608408. All right, Jolene, there you go. Congratulations. All right, so if there's no other announcements from anybody, then we'll go ahead and dismiss today. Thank you all again for coming, and happy Thanksgiving.